Artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hello and welcome to episode 173. Today I'll be giving some thoughts that were prompted by the upcoming AI Summit being hosted by the British government at Bletchley Park at the beginning of November. Bletchley Park, of course, chosen because it was the center of code breaking during World War II, led by Alan Turing, who is now on the 50 pound note, and famous for incredibly forward thinking about artificial intelligence at a time when computing didn't really exist and he was simultaneously inventing the field of computer science. I've been to Bletchley Park and I've sat in Turing's chair at his desk and I recommend that you go there and visit too. Just not November 1st and 2nd, they are going to be closed for the AI Summit. On a personal note, this episode is being released on October 9th, which is my late father's birthday. At the time he was born, there were more vehicles pulled by horses than engines. Radio was not something you could listen to yet, and electricity was not even universal. He became a teacher, and there must be something to epigenetics, because I feel the same drive, and this is what leads me to do this, and teach continuing studies courses, and give keynotes, and other things that are enabled by technology and facilitated by technologies that were not present when he was a child and barely conceivable by even the most revolutionary of science fiction authors. The later years of his life were made more painful by condition that we can now cure. I don't know what he would think of the world that we're living in right now, but I do know that he would recognize in me that same desire to help people understand the world around them. As I said, I am going to be giving some thoughts that were prompted by a couple of events that I've participated in lately. One of them was a preview event to the AI Safety Summit. More about that in a minute. And that event was put on by David Wood and the London Futurists, of which he is the chair. And you can find that online through the London Futurists YouTube channel. David has been on this show a couple of times already, and I recently had the pleasure of speaking to the London Futurists at his invitation in London at Birkbeck College. Do look for the London Futurists podcast with David Wood and Callum Chase on your podcasting platform. I make sure not to miss any of that, and it's an extremely good show. The other event was a panel discussion by MKAI, put on by my good friend and visionary Richard Foster Fletcher, who's been on this podcast a couple of times, and as I have been on his, MKAI, formerly standing for Milton Keynes Artificial Intelligence, now standing for Morality and Knowledge in Artificial Intelligence, which well describes the purpose and mission of his group. And that panel discussion was titled Generative 2028, Envisioning AI's Leap in the Next Five Years. Both of these events obviously concerned with what is AI going to do to the fabric of our society in the near term, and what should we do about that. The London Futurist event was asking us to imagine what we would say if we were speaking to the AI Safety Summit. And so let's explain what that is. On November 1st and 2nd in the UK, the government of Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will be putting on an event called the AI Safety Summit that invites people from different expertises within AI to come and brief government ministers and others about artificial intelligence to help them understand the space better and give them a better idea of what they should do about it. Obviously, with an eye towards regulation, whether they should be following in the steps of the European Union's AI Act and 
similar kinds of thinking. They had invited, I believe, Joseph Biden, U.S. president, who is not going and who is rumored to be about to make an executive order concerning artificial intelligence, but no information yet about what's going to be in that. And there were some high-quality thinkers at these events that gave us good reason to think about how much we should regulate or try to pause the development of artificial intelligence. As you know, there was earlier this year an open letter signed by a great many people who were quite distinguished and technologists within the field of artificial intelligence calling for a six-month pause in the development of large language models like GPT-4. In other words, saying, can we put off the development of GPT-5 by six months? And since GPT-5 has not yet appeared, one might perhaps assume that that effort was successful, although obviously there are other explanations. It was that letter more than anything else that propelled the question of, should we do this onto the world stage? Although the question of, can we halt this, is, I think, at least as important. There's a lot of discussion in these panels about parallels with other technologies that we have successfully or otherwise regulated on the global stage. One of those being nuclear weapons. Of course, another comparison is invited because of the possible existential threat of artificial intelligence, and perhaps also the in inevitable looming subconscious vision of the Terminator. But, of course, theories about how artificial intelligence might cause existential threat or extinction are not necessarily related to it being done by terminators. That's a very inefficient means, as we've talked about on this podcast before. So don't expect that just because we're all saying that Schwarzenegger-type robots stalking the landscape, taking out people cowering in foxholes, is unrealistic, that there aren't other ways that we believe that artificial intelligence posing a threat to the human race's existence are plausible. And so, of course, that brings us back to nuclear weapons. And some people have proposed strategic arms limitation treaty type agreements for regulating AI. Now, the comparison with AI and nuclear weapons might extend as far as existential threat, but there are of course, many key differences. Nuclear weapons are well-defined. The boundaries of one are well-defined. They're easy relatively to locate. You can find them with a Geiger counter. They're inevitably attached to delivery systems that are much larger. And critical mass defines the size of such a device. So that makes nuclear devices relatively large, even if you can pack one in a suitcase. And the facilities for producing the fissile material are usually large enough to be seen from space. And when Iran was developing a facility for centrifuging uranium, it was clear where it was, what it was doing to United States intelligence and they are widely believed to have been behind the Stuxnet worm that was targeted at that facility to infect the centrifuges and cause them to self-destruct. Whereas you cannot look at a data center and spot where there's a rogue AI running as opposed to this week's payroll for some company. The software just moves around all over the place and cohabits processes with other programs. So at the very least, you would have to have software type inspections that were capable of reaching into any computer which might be harboring artificial intelligence and seeing whether that was what was going on there. This just boggles the mind to think about how you would construct such a thing, but more importantly, how it would gain access to the places that it needs to run. Yes, at the moment, artificial intelligence of the kind that we are concerned about runs on large GPU clusters, and you can enumerate those fairly discreetly, but that's not going to be the case for very long. And even then, how can you find all the GPU clusters in the world? Are those regulated enough to be able to trace where those chips are going? 
I think these are important differences. Another one of the comparisons that's been made with successful regulation is with treaties that have halted chemical weapons research, and we've heard Stuart Russell make that on this show. I think it's the best argument that I've heard because most of the arguments about how nuclear weapons research isn't comparable don't apply. But you still do need protected facilities to develop chemical weapons. You need factories that protect the people who are in them because any kind of leak of a chemical weapon is lethal to people around it for quite some distance. So again, these are big facilities that are relatively easy to find. And of course, with AI, there is no production facility. You don't mass produce AI. Once you've developed the thing, that is the weapon, if that's the label you want to apply to it. There is no production phase. One of the more interesting comparisons would be with synthetic biology. I went into this in some detail in my 2017 book, crisis of control, because a virus is obviously very hard to detect, as we have found to our great sorrow in the last three years. Furthermore, the sequences for viruses such as Ebola are in the public domain, and you can buy used DNA synthesizers off eBay. Now, there's a lot of nuance to this that I get into in the book, uh, such as the difference between oligonucleotides and double-stranded DNA and what it takes to go from one to the other and the ease with which you can get one kind of synthesizer versus the other. And last time I checked, the availability of a synthesizer that could go all the way to double-stranded DNA was limited to one company, one synthesizer, which used cryptographic controls to ensure that you couldn't produce something dangerous on it without the proper authorization. I am sure many of us Engineers can think of how that sounds implausible in the likelihood of it being 100% reliable. Obviously, we cannot expect that kind of safety to remain intact for very long, and this is what prompted Eliezer Yudkowsky to say that every 18 months, the minimum IQ necessary to destroy the world drops by a point, a law that's been named after him. So for several years now, since I wrote the book, it's been an increasing source of surprise to me that we have not encountered waves of genetically engineered pathogens sweeping the globe, created by terrorists or rogue nations. That was a scenario that I had in the book, in the fictional section that is set in the year 2027, which does talk about a pandemic and also about having artificial intelligence that we can have conversations with as though it were human and which is able to write software to order. Remind you of anything that's going on now? Now, having talked to some of the people who are charged with keeping us safe from scenarios of synthetic biology in the wrong hands and being aware of how little sleep they get, I can only speculate that there is a lot of covert government agency work going on behind the scenes. So maybe... And this would make for the plot of an excellent TV show. Hollywood writers and producers, please contact me at peter at humancusp.com. Maybe there is already a government agency tasked with covert suppression or takedown of AI posing threats to civilization. I'll just pause for a moment to let your imagination run with that possibility and who you might cast in that. But the point is that governments have not put funding behind constructing biological weapons. By and large, they have treaties saying, we're not going to do this. Those treaties were, and I'm not an expert on this, uh, to my understanding, prompted by the fact that as long as we had nuclear weapons, then we didn't need chemical weapons or biological weapons. And so we would at least be safer by having only one way of eradicating the entire human race. And that may have prevented an arms race that would have put that technology for chemical and biological weapons into the hands of or within the reach of terrorists, rogue nations earlier, but it is clearly getting closer now. Now that you can buy DNA synthesizers and CRISPR gene editing kits on the internet and now that researchers recently reported that they were using AI to generate novel drugs, 
and thought, let's see what happens if we flip the sense of this, change a bit in this, so that instead of it producing beneficial drugs, let's see what it does if we change that direction and it will be producing harmful ones. And it very rapidly came up with some ones so toxic that they hurriedly turned it off. It wasn't making them, it was producing the formulas, but that's obviously close enough. So this diversion down the path of existential risk has been to reveal the motivation for people who are thinking in this space about pausing AI development, why that might be something that they want to do. One of the odd things about human psychology here is that it's hard to come up with scenarios where every single human being is wiped off the face of the planet. It's not impossible, but it is much more likely that any such scenario results in some survivors and usually enough to continue the species. And the odd thing about those is that a large number of people seem to react to that as though it's reassuring and that, okay, there's nothing to worry about, that the human race would continue. And it really is an odd sort of psychology when you think about it, that we would, or that anyone would think that something that eradicated over 99% of the world population wouldn't be something that deserves immediate attention. And yet there is that dividing line that I've seen between the way people think about something that might destroy everyone and something that might destroy nearly everyone. So let's just be clear that something that even comes up with plausible scenarios how AI could destroy 1% of the human population or pose severe threats to large numbers of people's livelihood is something to be taken seriously as possible reason for limiting or uh, halting the development of AI. And it frustrates me how little work is actually going on on this. And this is not to take away from the fantastic work that is being done at places like the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, the Future of Humanity Institute, or the Future of Life Institute, and many others that we've talked about on the show before and interviewed some of the people working there. It's just that compared to many other things that are far less important, the uh, amount of public money available here for funding such research is pitiful. I think the measure of a politician's commitment to an issue is the extent to which they will either sponsor legislation or, more importantly, put money behind something. And the amount of money for work mitigating AI risk is risible. When Elon Musk gave $10 million to the Future of Life Institute, people lauded him for paying such a large amount. Many people in his position would have said, oh, it's nothing. But he said, no, it really is nothing, or at least it's only slightly better than nothing, and pointing out that $10 million goes not very far at all. I mean, think about just what that would cover in salaries, and it's not even spent on that. By and large, that money is spent on grants to other people. It, it acts as a distribution point. And yet that was probably the largest single funding outlay for that type of work that had been made at the time, or probably since, from any individual or any government. I can say from personal experience that the amount of money that private individuals or private enterprises will put out to discuss or work on AI existential risk is extremely small. And yet it couldn't be a better example of a problem that should be solved by government. It affects everyone. The timescale is in the future and indeterminate. And it takes advanced, coordinated, centralized, and wide-scale preparation to do something about it. Uh, obviously, there are many parallels with climate change. And I know I personally could do far more to help in this arena if I could afford to do it full-time. Another one of the thoughts I had was that, well, suppose I was at the AI summit, uh, talking to the politicians there, and I thought I would say something like, you're listening to maybe a couple of dozen people here, I know there's a hundred on the agenda, but you can only focus on one thing at a time. You know, we take that for granted. People who try or think they can focus on multiple things at a time in multitasking has been more or less debunked. It's a human limitation. 
And so we don't think about alternatives since we are limited to being human at the moment. But there's no guarantee that the problem of AI management can be boiled down to elements that can be encapsulated within a human mind. You know, we have to start thinking about how we can manage things we cannot understand, which sounds like a pointless paradox, except that we do now have tools that can manage that because AI is starting to demonstrate ability to understand this kind of thing. And it won't be long before we have large language models that could analyze problems like this on scales that we can't. And therefore, one of the things that you, members of His Majesty's government, should do is initiate a crash program to construct AI that can, and here it sounds like the punchline to a bad joke of some kind, help us with understanding the problem of AI. I know that argument sounds both flawed and fallacious, and therefore dangerous, but I honestly think that there is a need here for a greater level of understanding than we can expect any politician to encompass, if not anyone else. And yet this summit is predicated on the age-old idea that if you put enough smart people in the room with leaders and let them talk enough, that the leaders will become smart themselves and know what to do. I question whether that's going to work this time. Another point I found myself thinking about in respect to this comparison is that we might be in a period that's equivalent to that that was immediately following the Second World War. In terms of the rate of development and immaturity of the science of AI compared to that of nuclear weapons, think about that phase of the Cold War. The United States was the clear leader of the world because every other country had been eviscerated economically and militarily. The war was over. No other nation posed a significant threat to the United States, and yet they still developed the hydrogen bomb. Now, when the atomic bomb, its predecessor, was being developed in the Manhattan Project, there was some non-frivolous speculation by scientists that its detonation might ignite the Earth's atmosphere, causing the nitrogen in it to fuse and destroy the world. If they thought that was at least possible with a 20 kiloton bomb, like the one they first detonated, surely you had to take the possibility of it happening with a 20 megaton bomb at least more seriously than that. And scientists like Hans Bether tried to get the hydrogen bomb halted. They were completely unsuccessful. Any delay in that program was too small to be measurable. So what is the likelihood of being able to halt something now on similar arguments, even if it was like the H-bomb and only had negative effects. But AI does not have only negative effects. It holds the high probability, as close as I would go to the point of certainty without making it 100% exactly, of delivering to us the cures for cancer, disease, and aging. Why would we want to slow that in any way? Now, most of you listening to me have had your lives touched by cancer and would react strongly to any proposal to halt something that could make a difference in that. So when people ask me if I want to stop AI, I think about that and I say absolutely not. Now, of course, no amount of benefit, no amount of curing cancer would be worth extinction of the human race. But if you believe that extinction is not 100% likely, then now it's a numbers game. Now you have to weigh the risk of one against the risk of the other. Um, Good luck. I really feel for anyone who's saddled with that responsibility, but we should at least try somewhere. I am willing to tolerate quite a lot of negative effects in order to get the benefits that I believe AI will provide. If we think about, say, wide-scale unemployment as one of those negative effects, and if I put that in very pithy terms, I would rather be unemployed than dead from cancer. So as you can tell, I've obviously had a lot of thoughts stimulated by these excellent panels, and I really look forward to more events in that respect. So what can government do beyond paying lip service and grandstanding, which is what we get most of the time? What sort of funding would be an expression of actual commitment? And I mentioned that I could certainly do more if I could work on it full time. This is not a crude attempt to beg, so let me take it off me and say that there are many, many other people who could say the same, who are qualified 
enough to make a material difference to our state of readiness for dealing with advanced AI, but the funding isn't there for them to do that. So it really is time that governments stepped up to the plate and created what I imagine to be some kind of international body with real funding to employ people to work on this problem together. Something that could coordinate and organize their efforts together. If you think by comparison with the Manhattan Project, imagine how ineffectual that would have been at developing the nuclear bomb if it was managed by sending out grant money to 50 different university physics departments with no coordination between them. If we know how to manage this to build an A-bomb, we should be able to do the same to ensure that AI is used to our benefit instead of our destruction. There are, as I said, a lot of uh, institutes and think tanks and university departments that do some sterling research on AI that measurably advance our understanding of the issues. When I first got into this field, I found myself frustrated when I looked at their work and learned that they're not there to influence, let alone make policy. They're chartered simply to do research. Now, in hindsight, that is inevitable. That's understanding. If Back then, though, I find myself thinking rather unkindly that these places would be more inclined to document the fall of civilization than to stop it. I have learned better. I don't want to be that unkind. But it is a fact of academic life that if you want an academic to make tangible progress in research and they want to publish not just for continued funding but just to show that that they exist, uh, that they're doing something, then they have to explore a narrow issue in a narrow sense. Science advances by a million tiptoe steps, not a few giant leaps. Okay, fair enough. But then who is going to do something about this? Who is going to recommend and make policy? Because there are many people talking about what needs to be done. And okay, I'm aware of the irony that I'm one of those people and this podcast is literally only talking. But the most charitable thing you could say is that we are helping to increase understanding and awareness of the issues so that people who are more likely to do things will be more likely to do that. And when it comes to action, that's either what private enterprise decides to do or what governments decide to do. Governments legislate. That's more or less all they know how to do. And right now, governments are mostly like deer caught in the headlights. They're getting the sense this is something that deserves to be regulated, but it's very unclear to them how to do that or whether any kind of regulation will simply obstruct the business of their country's high-tech industry. And who wants to do that at the worst possible time when every other nation in the world might be gaining a giant leap in their technical capability. So I think some kind of neutral international organization might be the best approach, and one that was raised in one of these panels by way of comparison was the International Atomic Energy Authority, or IAEA. And so I immediately thought of, how about an International Artificial Intelligence Agency, which has the snappy acronym IAIA, and surely that counts for something in terms of penetrating public awareness. Now, the United Nations has fallen out of favor with large swathes of the United States population, not just limited to the right wing, and so anything that even sounds like that, reminiscent of that, might be unpalatable to the people of the very country that would perforce supply most of its funding. So maybe we could draw the comparisons away from United Nations and more towards another body like the IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, which has been responsible for the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years for creating the protocols and agreements that keep the internet functioning so very, very well and open to everyone. Of course, the IAIA couldn't operate without money either, and it would need substantially more than the IETF because it would be involved in verification processes. And so eventually, governments are going to have to decide to commit their taxpayers' money to such a thing. Now, with Money sloshing around the AI industry like water in the pool at a frat house while people cannonball into it. Maybe it wouldn't be too hard right now at least to tax some of that 
to fund such an organization. Now, one of the places that people usually land in terms of how we will negotiate artificial intelligence becoming super powerful and how we might prevent that in the future is some kind of surveillance state. And this is even implied in my 2017 book, Crisis of Control, although it has about the most positive spin that you could put on that. I think we can see the possibility of that in China's reaction to large language models and AI taking off, which was to limit them actually far more severely and strictly than Western countries. They said that you cannot deploy a large language model unless it is producing provably correct answers, which we all know it's, they're not doing at the moment. So China has effectively called a halt to that kind of research within its own borders. And we're talking about, of course, one of the most, or probably the most, surveilled country in the world. So I can imagine that they would be thinking that that would be an adequate approach to limiting the development of rogue AI. And then there are countries like the United Kingdom, which outside of China probably has more cameras per square inch of the country monitoring the population than anywhere else, and has made a kind of de facto pact with that level of surveillance for the sake of the safety of its population, a pact that the United States would not be as comfortable with, and so you do not find nearly that level of monitoring of the population in the United States. But it is also, of course, a country that has much higher uh, homicide rates. We need to come up with directions that offer our politicians better arguments than landing on a surveillance society to preserve their countries. The Future of Life Institute has been running some story contests for some time that you can hear about on their excellent podcast, inviting people to imagine the most positive future that they can where AI becomes super intelligent to our benefit. And I would encourage you to listen to that and to read the stories. Because it's important that we are not just running away from a vision of terror and things that we don't want, but that we have a vision that is appealing that we want to run towards. This psychology of how we approach existential threat is of great interest to me because it's clearly something that we have to come to terms with. Many people, upon being informed about the magnitude of the possible consequences, including all the way up to extinction, become paralyzed or panicked. Maybe some of you did when we started this podcast. Apologies. It's understandable. I found out that how we deal with such things is a function of how much agency we feel we have. I and many other people deal in these scenarios daily. It does not paralyze us. It does not leave us permanently depressed and incapable of functioning. And yet we are more informed about this than the vast majority of people. And the reason for that is that we are doing what we can about it. And so that lets us function. That allows us that sense of agency. In the same way that people who do something about climate change, whether it's switch to an electric vehicle or limit the amount of carbon that they consume for fuel, can be aware that that's nowhere near enough to reverse the effects that we're facing, but it allows them to face those issues in a way that where they feel that they are doing something about it, that they are engaged. And I absolutely am not going to put down anyone for doing those things, even though they're of small effect, because obviously we need those small effects to be aggregated across a great many people, and then they will be large effects. So people who feel that they are engaged in the matter of artificial intelligence threat do not feel the same kind of dread and depression that people who have not figured out how they can be part of the solution tend to feel. So if you are on the dread side of that equation right now, start thinking about what can you personally do? 
that would enable you to feel that you were part of the solution. And some of the ways that we react to existential threat bear examination and adjustment, however. It's very common for us to want to only focus on a single large issue at a time. Our brains are limited in what they can process, as I said earlier. So people on hearing about an issue like AI threat might react like, oh, well, that's all very well, but the real problem is, pick your choice, for instance, global climate change. And then they try to get you to focus on that issue. Now, I think this is more a consequence of the fact that we can only talk about one thing at a time. And when we're talking about that one thing, we're not talking about the other things. It sounds trite to say that, but I think there is something to that theory that communication is single-threaded, but concepts are multidimensional. Whereas we really ought, of course, to be able to deal with multiple crises at a time without comparing them to each other. It would be a poor epitaph for humanity if it read, here lies the human race, couldn't handle more than one existential threat at a time. This linear nature of speech, writing, human communication means that when I am talking to you about the existential threat of AI, I am necessarily not simultaneously talking to you about the utopian promise that AI has a potential for, or any of the other existential threats that the human race faces. So if someone in my field is talking to someone else, with the goal of ensuring that they're aware of the importance of addressing the existential threat of AI, it takes a great deal of time to establish that through linear communication, because as long as they're talking about anything else, how do we know how important those things are relative to what we want them to understand? Whereas when I talk with people who are already in the field, such as David Wood, we've spent enough time in each other's company to have a solid understanding of where the other stands, and I don't have to go to extraordinarily length to qualify everything I say to ensure that it's unambiguous and lands the right way. The slowness of this communication is what frustrates so much of the attempt to get the word out about AI. And it's the reason I spend so much time talking about it. Because maybe by the time I'm done, it will have been enough words to convey some small part of the overall way that I think about it. We also need to avoid being trapped in a zero-sum game about existential threats. And some people might do this deliberately, like the idea that if someone is focused on artificial intelligence, that means that climate change is not being addressed. With 8 billion people on the planet, we ought to be able to divide the workload and take care of everything. You know, walk and chew gum at the same time. I know it sounds Pollyanna-ish to say it, but with so much transformation happening at the moment, with so much of our future in flux due to technology evolving? Can't we at least put some of how we collaborate and cooperate on the table for consideration? To be continued. In today's news, ripped from the headlines about AI, AI-powered smart glasses can caption and translate conversation at the same time. The inspiration for the XRAI glass began when XRAI co-founder Dan Scarf observed his 97-year-old grandfather who was hard of hearing. Dan thought to himself, if he's enjoying subtitles, why can we not subtitle his life? Co-founder Mitchell Feldman said, we've just opened Pandora's box. For us, the end state is that this will eventually end up on some sort of contact lens where it just becomes invisible to everybody and the user can just get the benefit of using our technology for betterment. End quote. You can see a list of the AR glasses, that's augmented reality, that are compatible with the app at xrai.glass. In other news, we can see that the Hollywood writers strike is over with agreement being reached on issues that included very notably and famously the use of generative AI which really calls for an advanced discussion about the impact of AI on jobs. And so in another solo episode, that's what we will be doing next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles at AIandYou.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.